founded Synergy Billing in 2006 to provide revenue cycle management, provider credentialing, and training for federally qualified health centers across the nation. In 2016, Synergy Billing was ranked number 767 on Inc. Magazine, list of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. The company also has been recognized as one of 50 Florida companies to watch and was the recipient of the first place award for medium, medium companies in the 2016 Bright House Regional Business Awards. Needless to say, that same year, Jason was named Young Professional of the Year by Volusia Flagler Business Report. As the company grows, Jason has registered, has resisted pressure to relocate Synergy Billing in order to attract larger numbers of qualified candidates. Instead, he has made a commitment to remain in Volusia County, where he was born and raised, and to train local residents in the skills that the company needs. Jason is frequently called upon to speak about creating and sustaining an entrepreneurial ecosystem. He is one of the founders of Innovate Daytona, a movement that is doing just that in Volusia County to support entrepreneurship. It is also worth noting that Jason has declined to accept the fee we traditionally pay our speakers to participate in this event. Rather, he has requested that the proceeds be donated to Hope Place, a, fam a family center just north of Daytona Beach that serves homeless students, children, and their families. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Meyer. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Let's see. Good morning. Oh, come on. The, the energy level in here is dangerously low. I need a little bit more. Give me a good morning. Good morning. That's great. That's much better. Now, guys, I'm really excited to be here and to speak with you. And, and I'll be talking to you not a, with some sort of a fancy speech, but really just telling you a story, telling you my story and my story in entrepreneurship and what got me here today. And so I call this presentation creating the hashtag Synergy Life. Because the Synergy life is what each of our employees at Synergy Billing, it is, it is what we live each day. And it's something that represents us working to be the best versions of ourselves, Aspiring for excellence, aiming for perfection, but settling for excellence, and trying to do our very best each and every day. And so we call it the hashtag Synergy Life. And really what it means is about following your passion and doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. But to come up with this idea, this philosophy, this mindset, this took a journey. And that journey is what I'm going to speak to you mostly about today. And that journey is really my experience, my story, which begins 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. And it's, it's an interesting thing, because when I first got started, I was actually in the computer business. I fixed computers. And I can think back to 1996. 1996, I was 13 years old, and I had just come off of a, um, of a recent excitement where a teacher had asked me to come and help fix a computer for him at Ormond Beach Middle School. And you see, I've grown up right here in Volusia County, so I went to Tomoka Elementary, I went to Ormond Beach Middle School, and for a short while, I went to Spruce Creek High School. And I was so excited that I fixed a computer, I was so passionate about computers and technology, I fixed a computer and I got paid $20 to fix it rocked my world. And I was so excited. And I remember going over the Granada Bridge in Ormond Beach, Florida. And I was there with my dad and my, my brother, who's almost two years younger than me. And I said, how cool would it be if we had our own company and we could call it Meyer Technologies? You know what happened? Not six short months later, we had a company called Meyer Technologies. And at first, it just started off with me fixing computers for friends and family. And I found that I was starting to make some money. You can imagine being 14 years old and you've got money in the bank and you've got a credit card. And it was at the time, Gateway Computers was really popular. And it was like a little Gateway credit card. I was like, that was really cool. Shortly thereafter, I had a cell phone. It was so big. It was like a brick because <laughs> people needed to call me for work. This was really exciting stuff. So now I'm thinking about ways to grow this little business. You know, of course, I'm 14. I can't drive. There's not much I can do without my mom. My mom and dad are here today with us, which is pretty neat. As, long as, as well as my wife, Misty. And um, we're driving, or we're, uh, they're driving me around to people's houses to fix computers. Really a neat thing. And I'm so excited. My self-esteem and my confidence are up. And I think, I'm, oh, this is really cool. How can I do more of this? And so I, I start thinking. 
And I said, well, you know what, I'm still in school, but what about the flea market? You're gonna laugh, the flea market. What do you do at a flea market? Well, I said, the flea market's open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I could go to school Monday through Friday, and then I won't work on Fridays, but Saturday and Sunday. So I, I pitched my parents the idea, and they, they agreed. They said, okay, but who's gonna go to the flea market for computers? I said, well, let's just try it. I've got the money saved up now, let's, let's do this. So it starts off, and it's a little slow at first. And, there, and there's a, a memory that stands out in my mind. The first weekend that we're at the flea market, and I, this time I'm 15 years old, and I remember thinking about having a, a booth at the Daytona Beach Flea Market, and I, I'm walking up and down the aisles, the smell of funnel cakes and beer are in the air, and um, I, I'm walking and I look up and I stop, and it's, it's a mirror and I see my reflection, and I take a step back and my hair's disheveled, my shirt's not tucked in, I look kind of like a mess, and, I, and I, all of a sudden I have this epiphany, and I say to myself, who was gonna buy anything from me? It was just this, kind of this realization that I've got to do something, that, it, that image matters because people, you have to build trust and credibility. And, I, and I'm, these thoughts were not, the words were not there at the time, but it was just this, what am I doing? It was this self-doubt moment. But I persisted and I stuck with it and believe it or not, the flea market ended up being something that was really good for me and it helped me to build my business and it turned into somewhat of a novelty where people would bring their computers on the weekend, I'd fix it, they'd come back and get it on Sunday and that led to more and more opportunity. Now by this time, I am so excited about my business growing. I'm starting to make money. I'm saving up for a car. I'm really excited about all these things. And I'm having a hard time focusing on school because before this, I was a straight A student. Tight-laced, always focused on getting good grades. Because much like all of you, I was taught from the beginning, in order to be successful, you've gotta be smart. In order to be smart, well, good grades indicate smarts. So focus on good grades, be smart, then you'll be successful. So I associated myself with that goal of trying to be smart. And I kept going down that path, and then all of a sudden I realized that I could do, I had a skill, a skill that I had developed, and my focus shifted. I could no longer focus on school the same way. So I put together a plan, and I presented it to my parents, and I said, what if I become homeschooled? They do it in Hollywood, the Hollywood stars do it all the time, it works for them. And I remember my dad saying, well, this isn't Hollywood, and you're not a star. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I was able to talk them into a short trial period. And this is right before I turned 16. And at this time, I'm in my second year of high school, first semester. And I just, I, I can't think about school anymore because I'm so excited about what my business could do and could be. And so now, I'm 16. Whew, game on. I can drive. I never thought I'd live to that, see that day where I'd be able to drive a car. It was... Because for so long, from 14 to 16, my mom drove us in a conversion van to every person's house that we'd fix a computer for. So I was so excited on the day that I could drive and I could start doing that for myself. So now it's game on and the business is starting to grow and I've, I've moved from the flea market and helping people at home to now I am working with businesses and I'm learning about networks and servers and I'm reading Reading, reading, I'm not going to any school, any school for this. I'm just so excited and so passionate that I become a sponge and I learn how I learn. I learn the best way for me to absorb information. So I learn everything I can about this and my business starts growing. I get some office space and it's starting to grow and I'm getting more and more clients. I've got very low overhead so the majority of the money I'm making is just going to the bank. And this is so exciting for me. And now by the time I'm 17, I'm recognized on Oprah Winfrey. I get to go on the Oprah Winfrey show as you can imagine, being 17, my head was so big. I had to walk sideways to get through, get through doors. So it, but it was a really neat experience. And I got to go with my dad and my brother. And we went to Chicago and got to be on the Oprah Winfrey show. And the business is growing. And now I've got this great idea to expand into software. Because that's a logical progression, right? You go from computer hardware and technology to software. Well, I'm 17. I, don't know what I don't know, but I know everybody says that there's a lot of challenges in business, that it's hard. And I'm thinking, what's so hard about this? Ah, the kiss of death. The ego is the enemy. And you can imagine being 17 and not really experiencing adversity or failure yet. Everything is seeming so easy. And then I, of course, got a great support system with my family. So I just jump. And I don't even look down, I just jump. And I decide that I'm gonna start developing medical software to do the billing, because I'm serving a lot of doctors. I've got a lot of clientele that are doctors, and they're having a tough time getting paid. And I'm so ignorant to this industry, to these challenges, 
I just think that software and technology are the answer to everything. So what do I do? I go all in on developing a software. I start researching every software that's out there. And this is around 1999, 2000. And this is a time when web-based software is becoming more and more popular. Web-based software is the future, and this is when a gentleman named Mark Benioff used to work at Oracle. Anybody know who Mark Benioff is? The CEO of Salesforce.com. Mega wealthy individual, right? Worth billions of dollars. And he decides to go off on his own and start a web-based software company called Salesforce.com. And I can see where this is going. And I want to ride those coattails and develop a medical software that does what he's doing, because I see this as the future. So every penny I've earned, I go into this, and I don't even think twice. And I, I pitch it to my dad, and he, he agrees, this is the next big thing. Of course, not having experience with something, you don't know how much, how long any of it's going to take. And so we go down this path, and believe it or not, there's a time where I had a, at 17, I had a million dollars. I had a million dollars in the bank, and I thought, man, I'm set. Well, I went a couple years later, and I went from a million to owing half a million dollars. All right, so imagine this now. I'm going to fast forward from going down this path of software, realizing I don't have enough money to do this, putting everything into it, and thinking, no problem, I'll go public, I'll raise money. And then something happened on September 11th, 2001. And it changed the whole world, changed everything. It changed capital markets, it changed business, it changed life, it changed safety. And I was stuck. Now through that process, I was focused on developing software. I had two products. One of them I could never finish. One of them I did finish. And I had 20 employees. And I had a huge amount of debt. And I had to let every one of those people go. And it was just me and my mom in a one-room office selling software. And now, now I'm 18, 19 years old. All my friends have gone off to college. I have no college education. And I, I have now a GED, which is okay, I'm okay with that. But I, my friends are in college, they've got education, I've got no backup plan, I'm stuck, what am I gonna do? Whew, it's tough. Now it's 2001, 2002, and I'm thinking about, what am I gonna do? I'm in a corner here, what do I even know? I know computers, I know technology, and now, through developing this software, I know a great deal about billing, about billing, medical billing, healthcare billing because I've had to become an expert in order to develop this software. So I couldn't develop the software, but I learned the process. And I took that knowledge and I started a company. And that company first did billing for private doctors. And as Mr. Lavasso mentioned in the beginning, I, I started in 2006 a company called Synergy Billing that works specifically with nonprofit community health centers. But what do we do? The way he described it and the way we describe it a lot of times is really complicated. But at the end of the day, what we do is we make sure that people get paid for the services in healthcare. We process claims to make sure that every one of them gets paid appropriately. We use technology and we use business process improvement to bring in more money. So break it down to dollars and cents. We increase the per visit revenue by about 20% for nonprofit health centers. It's huge. So it's a lot of money, right? And that, everything else is a complicated way of saying we bring in the money and we're good at figuring out how to do that from insurance companies. And so we're really a technology business, and it started in technology, and it's evolved into technology again today. But there was that time period from about 1999 and 2000 to about 2005, where I had to work my butt off to pay back half a million dollars. And I'll tell you what, nothing builds character like having to pay back debt. You can imagine the journey of having to go through while all your friends are in college, much like many of you, and you're trying to whittle away at debt, whittle away at debt, and you have nothing to fall back on. You know, sometimes that's when we perform at our best is when we have no safety net, when there's no other options. You know, fast forward with this story, and 2006, I start working with these nonprofit health centers, and I find that their values and what they do are in alignment with who I am and what I believe in as a person. I stop working with all private doctors and begin only working with these community health centers. And I began focusing and building and building. And there's so much demand. We have such a, a strong value proposition where the services we provide more than pay for themselves and put money back into communities that we have a waiting list of clientele. It's fantastic. You know. But keeping up and managing that growth, that has been the trick. That has been the challenge. So the journey is filled with little, little potholes along the way. 
And what I'm hoping I can share with you through some of my story and experience are ways to avoid some of those potholes, but also some of the lessons that you learn or that I learned along the way. And through that process is a concept that I call failing forward. You know, and the word failure, if I say that word, there are two words in the human language that elicit a reaction with the eyes dilating. One of those words is help. If you say help, eyes dilate, people stop. And if you say failure, whoa. And that's why most people don't set goals, because they're afraid of failing. So I came up with a concept called failing forward. And this was inspired by my mother, who taught me it's not failing if you learn a lesson. She would say that over and over again when I was a kid, pounding it into my head. And so I brought that with me, and I said, every, every time there's an experience, it's not about me, it's about what I learned from that experience. And as long as I take that and I incorporate that into the future, I'm moving forward. I'm failing forward, but it's not stopping me from moving forward. And so that was a really powerful concept for me, because by failing forward, I was never afraid to take that leap. I always knew if it works well, great. If it doesn't work well, there's something to gain too. I'm going to learn a lesson. I'm going to do it better next time. And that just got ingrained into me from a young age. And I'd say it's the single biggest factor to success is being able to cope with the failures and being able to persist when everything else seems dark and dreary and there's no way, no, there's no way out of it. You've got to keep pushing. So being able to mentally cope with those challenges is so key to being an entrepreneur. You've got to build m mental toughness. And so for me, through this journey, it didn't build character, it revealed character. It revealed who I am inside because of the challenges. And what it, what it made me realize is that we should constantly be learning, improving. And so Fail Forward became a, a philosophy, a mindset around continuing to pursue the best in everything and not being afraid to take a risk and to take a chance. Because there's always something to learn and gain, even if you do fail. One of the other techniques I learned along my journey was about the power of visualization. And I read this in a book because I don't have a traditional education. I think everybody chooses a path in education. Some people choose college, which I would recommend for my five children. But some people take a non-traditional route by, like myself. And they learn a lot through bonehead moves and making mistakes and reading. So I am a avid reader, and you'll hear most leaders will talk to you about leaders are readers, leading is power, reading is power, and it's so true. Because especially for somebody without a formal education, you've got you've to interpret everything going on, then you've got to process it. And one of the things I read in a book called The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is the concept of thinking with the end in mind. And that made a lot of sense to me, because I said if, if we're going to pursue a goal or a dream or a vision, how will we ever get to the destination if we haven't thoroughly thought through what success looks like? And I didn't think this was a unique way of thinking. I just thought it made common sense. But you know what? Something I've learned on my journey is that sense is not so common. It's actually more uncommon. Because most people don't think about what, what they're trying to accomplish. So what I realized on my journey is that I always had to create a laser sharp focus on what it was that I wanted. I had to picture it in my mind so distinctly, so vividly, that it almost became real. And the way I did this, and this is a technique I want to share with each of you young people in the room today, I would write stories. What are you talking about, write stories? Jason, you're crazy. No, I would make it so real. I would write it in the future, 10 years in the future, five years in the future, 20 years in the future. And I would say, today is October 18th, 2028. And I would paint the picture first of what's going on in my world. How old are my kids? I didn't have kids in the beginning. But what am I doing? What's going on? And then I would talk about my business, my company, and where it's at, and what it looks like. And I would make it so real, so real that it became real. And you know what the only difference was? When I look back at those notes today, I started doing that in 2003. Those things all came true. They just didn't come true when I wrote down the date. But the power of visualizing and creating that in my mind's eye it became so real that even today I can picture such vivid things. And I see things like motion pictures because I, I think about visualizing it. And it's a technique that anybody, doesn't matter how creative or non-creative you are, anybody can develop it with practice. Because I couldn't do this 20 years ago. But such a powerful technique. And so the lesson that I learned there was to always begin with the end in mind 
and to think about it so vividly that it's almost real, that it already exists in your mind. So another thing that I learned through this experience was about developing the right mindset. The mind is an interesting thing. It's actually designed to deceive you. And why, that sounds crazy, right? Deceive, your mind deceive you. Well, as human beings, we have evolved. We've evolved dramatically from five, 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, we were still very primal as a, as a species. Now, we've evolved to the point where we've got internet, we've got social media, we've got all these things. But biologically, that hasn't evolved at the same pace. And so what happens is our survival mind plays tricks on us. It's always about trying to protect. Because think about 10,000 years ago, we're, we're trying to make sure we're not chased by a saber-toothed saber -tooth tiger or something. In today's world, we're trying to make sure that somebody likes us on Facebook. Wait a minute, I don't, nobody liked my post, what's going on? We become hypersensitive and aware, and it's a way of surviving in a different paradigm. So the mind, and, and developing a coat of armor in your mind where you have mental toughness and strength and you can, you can balance these things out, I learned was so important. And I'll tell you a, a story that's kind of interesting, is that going through and owing half a million dollars, and it being in my dad's name, so there's nothing that I can do, it, it's in his name and I gotta pay it back. You get a lot of phone calls from bill collectors, right? And there is nothing worse than owing money and not being able to pay it. And so I got to the point where every time a phone would ring, I would cringe. <laughs> the phone, it's somebody wanting money. And I had to juggle this, and it forced me to develop a toughness, a mental toughness. And I read a, a book one time about, um, it's called Eating Frogs or Eat That Frog or something. It's about doing the things you don't want to do first. Get them out of the way. And so I said, you know what? Everybody, every bill collector, I'm just going to call them. I'm going to let them know I don't have any money. I'm just going to, I'm just going to address it. I'm going to get head on. And it forced me to develop a mental toughness. So the lesson that I learned through the experience and developing the right mindset was about this tool being designed, being sharp, to help me with whatever it was that I visualized. It needs to be there to support me, not fight me. And so I've got to take control of it, not let it control me. And for so many of us, our, our minds deceive us. We see things not as they truly are. So that was a lesson that I learned, is you really have to focus on developing that mental strength and toughness and not getting distracted. And what, at the end of the day, if you slice it apart, it's really about focus. It's about being able to focus and quiet the other noise and focus in on what you really want. So that was one of the lessons that I learned through this experience. Another thing that I've learned over the years is about keeping your tools sharp. And what do I mean by that? You know, you've got to constantly be improving. Const you can never just rest on your laurels and just sit back and relax. And I used to think, man, I've, I've finally gotten to that point of, whew, I can take a breath. But the world is constantly changing. And my, the takeaway that I, I had from this lesson learned is about staying hungry always. And that you've always got to be hungry for more, to learn more, to be more, to be the best you can be. And if you strip all of that away, what I learned is that life is about creating more life. It's about creation. And I think about each of us as co-creators. We're all here on this planet, and regardless of what your religious or theology beliefs are, we are here to co-create with whatever that universal source is. We have the same abilities. And so it's really an interesting thing because we're supposed to create more and more life and give more and more forward. And that's the concept of abundance and paying things forward. And so what I learned here is I've got to constantly be pursuing more and more to be the best but at the same time, be giving more and more when you have abundance. It was a very interesting, interesting thing. And so I got to a point where I finally worked myself out of, of debt. My business is growing. I could finally take a salary. And so I, I've spent 20 years doing this, 20 years. The first 10 years were very miserable. The last 10 years have been pretty fun. But the first 10 years were nothing but challenges, setbacks, and I kept persisting no matter what. Now, I did that because I really didn't have another option. And most people, they go down this path, and there are so many times on this journey where if I was giving myself a business advice, I'd say, you need to do this, you need to, do, you need to get out of this and do something else. And so I find that interesting because now, as a more seasoned entrepreneur, I would have advised myself to do something else, but I wouldn't be here today if I'd given up, right? And that just shows you that as an entrepreneur, 
Persistence is so key because just when you think that you're going to fail, you break through and you get to the next level. Success is just around the corner. So it was an interesting thing. And then as I got to a point of success, I noticed another plateau is that I didn't feel challenged anymore. I didn't feel like I was creating as much as I did before. And I had to find something to get me hungry again, to get me back in the game. And what I realized through all this is there's no substitute for hard work and persistence. You just got to keep pushing. So fast forward to today, and there's been so many lessons learned through this journey. It's not just been about success. It's not just been about making money in business or entrepreneurship. It's really been about life and living and living life to its fullest. And so I look at it as thriving. Thriving in what I've coined the synergy life, the hashtag synergy life. And it's, it's really about seeking gratitude in each moment. And I know we hear the word gratitude a lot. It sounds kind of cheesy to a lot of us. It did to me for a long time. But if you peel back layers of what gratitude is, it's appreciation. It's appreciation for what you have, even if it's your, only your heartbeat. It's appreciation for that. And that, I found, is really the key to sustaining and being successful in the, the Synergy life, is appreciating everything you have and every moment that you get to, to enjoy it. So with that being said, that's just a little bit about my, my story and my experience. And I know that um, some of you have class and some of you have questions. Uh, before we conclude, though, one thing I was very surprised that, uh, for, first of all, I was very surprised and honored to be asked to come and speak to you all today. And I was even more shocked that they wanted to pay me to do it. And I said, I don't think I'm, wor I don't think I'm worth that. Uh, and I felt more compelled to, to donate the, the proceeds, the honorarium, to one of my, my favorite charities. And so before we conclude, I did want to invite Ms. Farouk Husseini up here to the stage to, to, to accept this check on behalf of Halifax Urban Ministries and Hope Place. And I, I am just so grateful for all the things that the senior family do for our community. And thank you very much. And I hope that this helps to advance Hope Place further. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. That means that we have a few minutes for questions because I was asked to tie it up about this time. And if anybody does have any questions for me, I believe that Tracy is coming around with a, a microphone. And if not, if you don't feel comfortable asking questions in an open environment, I'll stay around for a little while longer if you have any, any questions for me. But while we're here together, does any, anybody have a question? building going in the future like your more more advanced um, vision of the yeah. of your company you know I, I haven't spent too much time talking about that but I will briefly uh, talk about the, the future with synergy building and I think our company is really poised to do amazing things in the healthcare industry this is an industry that is really behind the times uh, what we do today is very people and process oriented and we're developing a technology that will automate a lot of the processing of, of healthcare claims and transactions. So it could go in many different directions. What I see Synergy Billing evolving into is a platform that connects uh, providers, patients, and health insurance companies together to manage the transactions between those, uh, those different entities. Uh, today we do that, but through processing claims. In the not too distant future, we'll be the ones that are actually processing and adjudicating the claims. Uh, so I, I see us continuing to grow. Uh, we're in the process of building a, a campus in Holly Hill. We're investing in the Holly Hill community, and it's actually called the, the Fountainhead. And it's a 25-acre campus that has a, an academy where we teach this trade, we teach this skill, and then we have experiential learning. So we're actually under construction right now, and it's not that far away from here. So we do expect uh, some continued growth in our business. Thank you for your question. Oh, yes, Ms. Hussain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one of those questions I could answer. So it's January 1st, 2025. How many people and how many employees? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to have any more than five children. That's for sure. I've got five children right now. The oldest is nine and the youngest is two. Uh, the employee question is an interesting one because our business is really evolving and, and we do a town hall meeting every quarter. A town hall meeting is when you bring everybody together and you communicate things. Well, the more we do this, the better we get at this. So we automate a lot of things. 
And people get afraid of automation, like, oh, I'm going to lose my job. We have a guarantee to every one of our synergists that if you automate your job, you get a bonus and you get a, a position of equal or better pay. Because we want everybody thinking about continuous improvement. And there's so many things that we've been able to use technology to, to automate. It's tough for me to answer that question of how many, because we're continuing to refine and find better ways. But what that means is that margins expand, and now we can invest in, in more areas of growth. So we may have many employees, but they just may be doing different things. But certainly several hundred. I mean, we're just over 100 employees now, and we're at full capacity of our existing space. And once we move into to our campus environment, we'll be poised to, to add 100 to 150. So we'll really be opening the floodgates. And my vision is to be able to take somebody with no prior experience and build them from the ground up into our field. And that doesn't just mean processing, doing data entry. That really means being an analyst, being analytical, being able to use problem solving skills to troubleshoot and make sure that claims process the first time. And what's really unique about our business is that it's, instead of invoices, we have something called claims. And those claims are paid for by health insurance companies. In this industry, <clears throat> the standard is normally 90 days to resolve these. We've moved that to 30 days, 30 day resolution, which nobody can touch. So we resolve claims in 30 days, and we've been able to demonstrate what's called Six Sigma performance for several, several of our clients, which means that we're processing darn near 100% paid resolved within 30 days. Nobody in our industry can touch that. So that's what that continuous improvement mindset, when you constantly strive for perfection, but then settle for excellence. That's something that I actually learned at the Disney Institute that really has resonated with me. Aim for the very best you can achieve, and then settle on excellence. I see a question. Oh, we got one right over here. Uh, based off of what you just said, what is your distinction between perfection and excellence? Ah, great question. Well, perfection is 100%. Excellence is 99 <laughs> <laughs> No, I would, I would say that as it relates to synergy in our company, I can answer that probably more specifically, is perfection is 100%, excellence is 95% or better. You know, I think about being back in school. Uh, it's interesting, because when I was in, in grade school, when I first started, an A had to be 94% to 100%. And then somewhere in middle school, it went to 90% to 100%. I'm like, why are we watering down an A? An A means less now. But I think of anything, 95% or above is, is an A. And so that's what I consider to be excellence. Got a few questions over here, and then I know that many of you have class, so we're going to probably have time for two more questions. What do you think about blockchain technology? I, I don't know a whole lot about it, except I think it's going to be the, I think the future of currency, you're going to laugh. How many of you have seen that movie, Ready Player One? Seen that? Really cool movie, probably my favorite movie right now. But in that movie, everything exists in what's called the Oasis, which is this virtual community. And, and people spend more of their time here than they do in regular life. And it's created this whole currency, this whole platform of exchange. And there are companies right now, one of them is called Magic Leap down in Fort Lauderdale. They're developing technologies that are really going to be game changing for the way we experience the world. It's more than just goggles. They can even project an image onto your retina without you having stuff on. It's nuts. And I think what's going to happen, blockchain technology is going to become a component of these transactions because it's all going to be digital and electronic. So I don't know a whole lot about the technology itself. You know, I started off as a tech guy and now I'm an I'm a amateur technologist. Uh, but I, I do see everything moving towards digital currencies and this, the security of that is going to be really important. I see another question in the back there. Are you hiring? We are. Actually, we are. And, and it's interesting. I, I, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Kaylin Grant, who is in charge of uh, recruiting at Synergy Billing, is, is up here right now. And we're actually looking for four to six individuals that have no experience in healthcare but are very ambitious, eager, and want to learn this industry. And we're going to teach them from the ground up. We're going to start that uh, between November and December timeframe. Uh, so if you are interested, we are hiring, we're looking for some candidates that are hungry and that we will teach and train. We've done that before and we want to do that again. So yes, we are hiring. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I'll stay back if anybody else has more questions.
Thank you. It's really an honor to be here.